morning, everything. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and everything, if you're so inclined. My name's Lorene. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. It's been a bit of a day. It's uh, hot and humid. We just got back from um, getting glasses or, you know, picking them out and ordering them and stuff. Steve and I have been meaning to do that since uh, him in January and myself in March. So uh, this is the first time we've been able to get in there. And uh, it's going to feel good to have some glasses that are um, just a little more functional. And I kind of broke these ones in the February. I rolled on them and the arm bent on them, so they were always falling off. Anyways, they were repaired and they work. But in the meantime, um, I just don't get to do any of the traveling that we were going to do for 2020 and Steve's sabbatical. So I decided, well, if I can't get on a plane, I'll buy some um, new eye. I wear. So anyway, that's my crazy story, but I have a question for you. It's a mystery. How does the little cat, Cleo Bell, you've, many of you have seen her, she's got little paws about this big, the litter box is at the top of the stairs and it's sawdust because it's a renewable resource and it's biodegradable and we can put it in the compost. She manages to get the litter trail down the stairs and around here and into the kitchen she has to have pockets full of it. I just, I cannot figure how that little thing carries so much junk every day. So that's today's mystery. And it has absolutely nothing to do with books, but she heard me call her name. So here she comes. <laughs> yeah, you're driving me crazy. I have two really, really super duper good books for you today. The first one is The Journey of Little Charlie and it is written by uh, Christopher Paul Curtis. So I looked him up, uh, Christopher Paul Curtis, on um, his site, and he was born in the United States. I believe he's currently residing in Windsor, Ontario, I, I think. Um, anyhow, he has won a lot of awards for his books, and he's been writing for, um, uh, I don't know, at least two decades, if not more. And every book I have read by this author is absolutely solid. And I will include a link in the doobly-doo below to his site directly because there are two, four, six, eight books that um, he's written. I have read all but one of them. And that one, for some reason, is not at the library, but it is available as an audiobook. So that's my, uh, that's my plan for the coming weeks for that, an audiobook. The Journey of Little Charlie is quite a bit different than uh, his other books because in this case, we are going with Little Charlie, who is actually around six foot tall, 12 years old, really had um, much too early growth spurts. And considering how poor his background is, you'd wonder how he made it that tall nutritionally. And his dad had also been um, extremely tall and strong. So in the beginning, we meet Pa and Charlie, and there's a catastrophe of sorts. And the neighbors is a plantation, the Tanner Plantation, which is about the worst of the worst kind of Southern plantation pre-Civil War. There is absolutely no compassion, empathy, or just, there's just nothing with respect to Black Lives Matter at all, it's zero. And so in the culture that Charlie grows up in is um, a poor white culture. And they don't have a whole lot to be proud of themselves. I mean, they're just sharecroppers. They've lost the property. And they're not doing much better than the people in the plantations adjacent to them. So what happens is um, Captain Black comes into play as a result of the, the c catastrophe. And he manipulates things. And, and can, well... I don't even know if he really, he coerces, he doesn't convince, he coerces little Charlie to go on a trip with him up to Detroit, Michigan, where he is going to, under the new laws, he is going to retrieve uh, a male and a female black slave who had had a child while all three of them had been on the Tanner Plantation and they had escaped. And word had come down that uh, their whereabouts had been discovered. So this is the journey physically and also um, emotionally that little Charlie has to undertake with this black guard, Captain Black, who is just like evil, just really, I mean, you can, there's a certain point every so often where you can get a glimpse of why he's such an awful character. So oh, you can just have this thin, thin, thin wisp of a thread of, of sympathy for Captain Black. Maybe if 
some things hadn't happened, he wouldn't have been so horrible. But once he became horrible, he relished being hor horrible. So very little redeeming characters there. They get to Detroit. They encounter the runaway family. Things are, are really very interesting. The way that the family has resettled and restructured and embraced their freedom as well as protected their children um, is just r a really interesting. And what I love about this book is we're seeing it from little Charlie, a white boy's point of view. And he hasn't got any adults in his life to uh, educate him, to uh, give him any kind of picture of what it's like to be blacks, or and certainly not what it's like to be a slave, although he, he has understanding for the physical labor because in his own, his own world, he's definitely got too much physical labor for a 12 year old. So this is a journey of both, um, you know, geography. It's a journey of um, awareness because he's just familiar with this very tiny part of where he lives in South Carolina up to Detroit and as and then eventually um, further on, which I won't tell you because I can't tell you everything. Oh, hello. And um, I loved it. It was a completely different point of view and we do encounter uh, the town of Buxton, which features in a couple of the other books that uh, he has written, um, the Elijah of Buxton and, um, do, 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 what's the other one? Mighty Miss Malone, I think there's another, there should be a third one. Unless they count this one as a third one. That's what I wasn't clear on when I checked things on Google. I thought, is this the third in the book or are we gonna see something different? It could stand alone because the only thing we encounter in this book is the town of Buxton where those other two books I just mentioned, that's where the characters actually live. So we don't see any of those characters really. Um, this book would be an amazing companion book to any of other uh, Christopher Paul Curtis's books. And an amazing, if you're doing homeschooling or if you're just trying to come up with some kind of interesting combination of books for, um, if they're, you know, sometimes kids have to do a, a compare and contrast book report with this um, and any other book that's written about um, children. So this is a middle book. I maybe didn't, I should have said that earlier for middle readers and totally strong. Um, really, there's absolutely no complaints to be had at all about this author. So. I um, hope he does more. He's he's older, but uh, you know, you can still write when you've got gray hair. The second book is by Kaysen Callender, The K King and the Dragonflies. Kaysen is uh, identified through the pronoun they, so I hope I'm respectful and remember that. Uh, they have written several other books. The most uh, well-known is Hurricane Child, uh, Felix Ever After. This is kind of an epic love, love story. Those are all for YA middle, a, uh, middle readers. And he has two adult, they have two adult books, Queen of the Conquered and King of the Rising. And the gossip behind this story is that Kaysen had gone to some kind of book opening event with their uh, pub publisher or agent. And that person had said, you know, I don't think anybody's written a book about a middle grade character who's experiencing um, transitional questions, or maybe they're not even transitional, maybe they're just awareness, awakeness about where their gender is or where their sexuality lies, and just all those kinds of questions. We see tons of them in adult books and tons of them in um, YA, but um, so Kaysen took up the challenge and wrote this book, and it is wonderful. I, I think that these two books, in their way, would make a great compare and contrast book uh, because of the different authors and the different time frames. And King, his brother has passed away. We learned that quite early. It's it's kind of, you know, mo mystery movie disease. We, we do find out eventually why his brother has passed away, but it's, it's too long coming. That would be a detail that would be more useful up front. And um, King is a bit of an isolated kid. He's got two friends. Turns out that one of them is... Um, comes from a very unhappy background and is pretty sure that he is gay. And uh, so a lot of miscommunication between the three friends, the brother who uh, was part of the story, uh, how would I say that? So the brother was still alive 
when the friend revealed that they were gay. So he has some play in what comes out next. And the young girl of the threesome, three girl, the three friends, one is a girl, and she has a crush on King. And King, well, he loves her dearly. He doesn't want to disappoint her, but he really, you know, quite ambiguous about whether that's where he wants his life to be going. And, and you know, sometimes 12-year-olds just aren't ready for that right away. So, so we're really getting deep into King's thinking process and his awareness of who he is and what he is, how he needs to reflect himself back to his friend Sandy, who's the gay chap, and like what's going to happen with that relationship? How is he going to deal with his dead brother's memory, who's left some comments behind that are not really very helpful? His parents' grief, of course, it hasn't been that long after uh, the one son has died that we encounter this family so there's all that recent grieving and also just they haven't come around to all the anniversaries that one must when someone has passed away so um a, you know the birthday the thanksgiving christmas all that still has to be gone through for the first time without a significant family member so um we encounter king when he's about 12 years old going to middle school and his journey is pretty much interior, but also just navigating his own town and friendship. And of course, there's got to be, you know, some less than salubrious characters involved. Um, there's an adventure, there's some tension. The tension is very well drawn out. Um, I, I just, I adored this book. And I don't always like a book that is trying to, there's that phrase, you should read. Well, whenever I hear that, it's like, no, no way, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> so, in the best sense of it, this is a really excellent book that many kids would really enjoy reading, I think, because if they're not having that kind of um, self-awareness struggle that King is having, then it might help them to become empathetic for one of their buddies who is. Um, but, you know, I don't know that... I struggle with books that are improving. I, I, I'm reading because I want to be in a world that is habited, inhabited by characters that bring something new to the table. And these characters do, but it also brings a message around um, orientation and stuff. So very, very strong. I'm really looking forward to getting the other books. I'm going to do the middle grade books first and leave the adult books till later because the uh, King of the Rising is just a recent release, 2020, and I don't know if there's going to be a third, so I always like to wait a year or two before I, I dip my toes into a potential uh, trilogy. So, um, yeah, strong, strong, strong. Now, both of these books won awards, um, and both of these authors have won awards. So, um, Christopher Curtis is a Newbery Medal winner, and this one, doo -doo, with the hair caring child... Oh, what did it win? It, I think it might have won the American Library Association Award, or a really good war, award. So what I'm reading right now is Books of Umber by P.W. Catanis, Catanis, and Happenstance Found, Happenstance, happens. <laughs> Happenstance is the character, main character. He's um, come upon through some very adventurous, some Indiana Jones kind of uh, Dune-ish collaboration of images and geography and everything so it's quite exciting um, and there's some sort of magic there's some sort of world shifting I'm only about a third of the way through and it is a trilogy but it was written the first books in 2008 so I should be safe um, I'm really enjoying it it's quite a different book it's more of um, it's more of a lark it's more of a Saturday morning cartoon kind of a book and who doesn't love Saturday morning cartoons um, so I think that's it. Now I was going to mention the author Mildred Taylor. Mildred Taylor has um, written, gee whiz, I'm going to say she's more in the 1900s, like, you know, 1980, 1990. I'm not positive about the dates. I should have checked that. But she also has written about uh, children. Uh, black children either in the um, midst of being slaves or having escaped or doing the escaping or um, or families who have managed to um, redirect themselves safely 
they are the best books. I think whenever anyone says to me, who's one of your top 10 authors, she comes, whether, you know, whatever the age spectrum of the books we're talking about, she's definitely one of my top 10. Um, and yeah, I should look up her biography, see where she's at these days. Um, she also is a significant participant in the Coretta Scott King Awards. That's it for me. I'm hoping to have a few different books for you next week. I have all these books. You know, we were so determined to have books in the summer so that we didn't run out. I thought that we would somehow diminish the pile, but it's actually grown. I guess that's partly because the libraries have opened and we've been able to do that, you know, trick of putting things on hold. But um, yeah, the pile tripled. <laughs> so there's plenty to read and I'll have some more things for you next week. I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true. And if you know how a cat carries litter down a flight of stairs and across 20 feet of floor, you, you let, let me know. I'm curious. Bye-bye for now.